Women's Day, where it gives me great pleasure to introduce the international woman of the day, <laughs> Alsana Sabri. Alsana earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Dhaka in her native Bangladesh, following which she came to the U.S. and enrolled in the graduate program at LSU. And she joined my lab in January of 2015. And she took on this project that I think has challenged her patience on numerous occasions, mainly because of unexpected outcomes of what we thought were supposed to be straightforward experiments. And she's going to tell us her story today, um, entitled Mechanisms to Regulate Genes Encoding Clinically Relevant Multi-Drug Transporters at the Crossroads of Antibiotic Resistance and Oxidative Stress Detection. That was not <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Girl, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone, to my PhD exit seminar. And I'm Asama Sabrin, Dr. Girl Sikh, and I'm a PhD candidate from her lab. So today, I'm going to defend my PhD dissertation. And the title of my dissertation is Mechanisms to Regular Genes Encoding Clinically Relevant Multidrug Transporters at the Crossroads of Antibiotic Resistance and Oxidative Stress Detection. So I'll talk about transcription factors which regulate genes in bacteria and those genes are involved in antibiotic resistance and this transcription factor that can uh, sense post-derived oxidative stress or the conditions of oxidative stress. Before going deep into my presentation, um, I'd like to give you an outline. So I do work with Burkholderia, so that's a bacterial genus, so I'll talk briefly about Burkholderia followed by host defense mechanisms and against Burkholder infection or in bacterial infection. And in this case, I will be uh, focused on the reactive oxygen species or ROS. And I will uh, talk about my favorite protein family, MAR R, and uh, followed by the functional characterization of one of the MAR homolog uh, under the reduced and oxidized conditions. And last but not the least, I'll introduce a novel transcription factor to all of you, which is a very exciting discovery that uh, we have done actually during my PhD period. Okay, let's start with Barcloderia. So Barcloderia, that's bacterial genus, I say, and uh, that comprises a wide variety of environmental uh, gram-negative uh, pathogens. So these pathogens, uh, I mean, not only pathogens, but there are other pathogens. So uh, they are mainly found in the soil and groundwater, and many of uh, many species of this genus are uh, clinically significant pathogens. Uh, very well characterized pathogens are Barcoderia sibomale, Barcoderia male, and Barcoderia cepacea complex. Now Barcoderia sibomale, which is a soil saprophyte, and it causes an infectious disease that many uses. Okay, and uh, that mostly affects human. Barcoderia male, which is closely related to Barcoderia sigomale, and that causes an infectious disease <coughs> named glanders. And glanders mostly infect horse, dogs, or cats, but uh, it can, I mean, human can be infected too if they are in close contact with those animals. Now, Barcoderia cepacea complex, that comprises, that's a subgroup of this genus Barcoderia, and that comprises at least 20 species. And they can cause opportunistic infections. So that means that they can infect immunocompromised patients, such as cystic fibrosis patients. Okay. So according to Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, there are more than 30,000 people in the United States who are uh, to have cystic fibrosis, and among them, 2.6% are having this BCC infection. And this BCC can cause sebaceous syndrome in cystic fibrosis patients. And sebaceous syndrome that consists of like wide range of the symptoms of those Tumoral deterioration with bacteremia or the necrotizing pneumonia. So, as you see here, that um, these pathogen species, bacterial species, they infect various types of cells in the body. Okay. So, it, it's making the treatment process really difficult. And these pathogen species have attracted attention uh, also because in animal model, it requires, like at least in animal model, it requires very really low infection dose. Okay, and they're highly transmissible. There is no significant vaccination till uh, now by like, against this particular infection, and they are highly resistant to clinically relevant antibiotics. Barcoderia sibomale and male, they have been categorized as vital organisms by CDC. Be 
because they have been used in world wars as aerosol spray to infect human or other animals. So, to, I mean, you know, like facilitate infectious disease research or to design effective vaccine or to design, like redesign the last resort of antibiotics, we really need to know the mode of pathogenesis of this bacteria. We need to know the virulence factors. I mean, which is working to uh, infect different human or I mean, and human or animals or plants. So we need to know uh, and we need to characterize these particular species. Okay. So at the cellular level, once bacteria is phagocytosed by the host cell, they enter the primary phagosome. And uh, during phagosome mat phagosome maturation, bacteria. I mean, uh, there will be like very uh, I mean different virulence genes that will be activated, including the secretion systems and leading to bacterial disruption and bacteroscape. And once bacteria is inside the host cytosome, they can use host machinery for replication, leading to cell to cell fusion so that they can spread from one cell to another cell to establish infection. Okay. So this is a very general mechanism through which bacteria infect host or establish, uh, I mean, establish infection in host. Now, once bacteria is inside the host, what will host do? I mean, ghosts will not just keep silent and say, okay, hey, I'm infected, let me die. No, <laughs> it's not going to say that, right? So the early, very early stage of innate immune response in host against that infection is the production of reactive oxygen species, or ROS. There are different immune cells which are involved in the production of reactive oxygen species. So in general, uh, they can produce superoxide radical, okay? And superoxide radical can convert into hydrogen peroxide, now, hydrogen peroxide can uh, react with the available uh, redox active metals of the spheres and from our sulfur cluster to produce more reactive hydroxyl radical. And now, these reactive oxygen species, super radical or hydroxyl radical or hydrogen peroxide, can damage bacterial DNA, lipid constituent, or protein. Okay. So, once the bacteria is, or the pathogen is inside the host, and the host is bombarding the environment with reactive oxygen species, okay? So bacteria is not facing the harsh environment, but in a very hostile environment inside the uh, host. So what will bacteria do? So bacteria will try to survive there. And to do so, it needs to colonize the host, right? And it has to counteract the host defense mechanisms. And most of this adjustment occurs actually by changing the transcription profile of the cell or the gene expression profile of the cell, okay? So when we're talking about the transcription or the gene expression, there are different uh, transcription factors which are involved here. So one of the very known uh, transcription factor families is multiple antibiotic resistance regulator or MARA. So MARA, as I said, they are transcription factors and they regulate different genes which are involved in stress response, virulence, degradation of the toxic compounds or other cellular process that will help bacteria to survive in host environment. Okay. Now, depending on the environmental cues and the need that which genes need to be upregulated, downregulated for the survival of bacteria to establish pathogenesis, this MARA can act as transcriptional activator or repressor or both. Okay, let's look at the classical model of MARA. As I do work with MARAR, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about this. So MARAR exists as a homodimer. So what we're seeing here is a dimeric MARAR protein. One dimer is shown here with a rainbow color, and the other, uh, sorry, one monomer is shown here with rainbow color, and the other monomer is shown here with light green color. So usually MARAR exists, uh, I mean MARAR consists of six alpha helices and three beta strands. So, and it has a dimensional region and the long intersecting helices, alpha 1, uh, they can form the scaffold for the dimensional region. And this dimensional region is connected to the DNA binding region. And this alpha 4 helices form recognition helices of DNA binding region which binds to DNA. There is a wing region which, also, uh, which is also involved in the DNA binding region. And this winged helistern helix pattern is a signature structure of Mara homology. So MAR belongs to wheat and eastern helix uh, family protein. So now we have a little bit idea about the MAR structure. Let's see how it regulates genes. So the classical pathway uh, 
that Mara follow to regular genes is Mara binds to the intergenic region of its own gene and divergently oriented gene. Now, this intergenic region contains the promoter sequences of each gene. Okay? So, once Mara is there, RNA polymers can access the promoter element. And that will cause transcriptional regression. Now, many Mara hom homologues, they can sense different small ligands, such as uh, metals or oxidants or other ligands. So, once the ligands are in the environment, Mara can sense them or Mara can bind them, and there will be conformational change leading to attenuation of DNA binding. And now iron polymers can access to the promoter element and transcription will occur. This is a classical mechanism for mara mediated re gene regulation. That doesn't mean it always happens like this. There are other mechanisms too which mara form or mara exert to regulate different genes. Okay, let's get back to barcoder. So in our lab setup, it's difficult to work with pathogenic barcoder species or any pathogen factor species. So we prefer to work with non-pathogenic species. In this case, we work with barcoderal telendesis because it's closely related to the pathogenic species regarding their genomic size or the gene content. And also, uh, the level in a for barcoderal telendesis is uh, a thousand times higher than that of the pathogenic species in animal model. And that's making these uh, like species like safer to work in the lab environment without having massive to level treatment. Now, barcoderal telendesis harbors 12 annotated Mara homologues. Among them, one of the Mara, Mara gene is located in a very interesting genomic locus. So, this Mara gene is adjacently oriented from EMRPG, which encodes for an E. coli multi drug resistance transporter, and is also divergently oriented from two genes, RNG flux pump and HIP. HIP encodes for just a high voltage. So why I was interested to work with this Mara homologue or with this genomic locus? Because, as I said, I already mentioned that many pathogen barcoder species, they are intrinsically resistant to structurally diverse antibiotics. And these efflux pumps actually play a significant role to export or to transport uh, different antibiotics and disinfectants. And this RNG and EMRB, I mean EMRB transporters, they are like major transporters in bacteria, which takes our antibiotics. So it would be like, it's worth to see that how these efflux pumps are being regulated and whether this MAR is regulating this efflux pump expression or not. So we named this MAR homologue OSTR. And from now I'm going to address this gene as OSTR. So OSTR stands for Oxygen Sensing Transport Regulator. So that means this protein regulates transporters and also it can sense oxidant. So let's see how it's, all these things are going on and how this oxygen sensing is, whether uh, uh, like impacting the transporter regulation or something like that. Okay, so we were interested to see whether OSTR is regulating EMRB expression and also heat and RNA expression, those genes are located on the same genomic focus. As it's a, a like as we're seeing here, there are four different genes involved here. So I'd like to talk about EMRB expression, uh, regulation of EMRB expression by OSTR first, and then I'll go to the other part of the genomic focus. Okay, so the question is: does OSTR regulate OSTR and EMR? So here I'd like to mention that many MARA homologues, they are autoregulatory. So they bind to our own proper sequence and thus I mean, regulate their own gene expression. So we're interested to see that, uh, first of all, Western is regulating EMR or not, and Western is regulating its own gene expression or not. So to answer this one, we obtained two different mutant strains. In one strain, OSTR gene was disrupted by the insertion of trans boson at 98 position of open reading plane. In another mutant strain, EMR gene was disrupted by the insertion of so we determined EMRB expression in wild tech and delta OSTR that they experimented. And as you're seeing here, when OSTR is not there, EMRB is upregulated at approximately 25 volt. So OSTR is the transition repressor of EMRB. OSTR regulates EMRB. So now to complement these strains, we created two different strains. Wild tech E and Delta Oyster C. So the purpose was to see the restoration of the wild tech level of EMRB expression. 
purpose, purpose was to see uh, EMR will be pressure in these complemented strains. So, Y type E, that is actually Y type strain that is transformed with uh, a plasmid which harbors gentamicin resistant acid. And delta oyster C is the oyster mutant that is transformed with the same plasmid, but it harbors our oyster gene too. Surprisingly, what we have seen that EMRV is significantly upregulated in these complemented strains. So as I mentioned that the expectation was to see repression of EMRV for the restoration of what that level of gene expression, right? But what we're seeing here that EMRV is significantly upregulated, so that's surprising. So what we were thinking that EMRV is regulated by OSTR. So there's something going on with the OSTR. And so what we did, we determined OSTR expression in y E, and as we're seeing here, that gentamicin actually represses OSTR. And uh, that's why you see that EMRV expression actually goes up in these complementary strains. Just to make it clear, we bring these cultures in presence of high dose of data mass. So now, this is a thing that you need to think about. Because gentamicin is one of the commonly used antibiotic to treat bar I mean to bacterial infection. We use gentamicin to kill bacteria, not to make bacteria more resistant, right? If sublethal dose of gentamicin is uh, upregulating one of the major efflux pump in bacteria and making it more resistant to the antibiotic, so before using gentamicin for clinical trials or medical use, we need to think about that. We need to come, come up with some other idea. Okay, so it has a clinical importance in that case. So now, to see whether oyster is auto-regulatory or not, we uh, designed the primers based on the upstream region of the transposal insertion. And as we're seeing here, that there is no significant difference in the OSTR expression in y -tech and delta OSTR. So that means OSTR is not binding to its own promoter and degrading its own gene. It's not auto-regulatory. So for so good? Okay, let's move on. So now we know OSTR regulates EMRV. So the next question was whether OSTR is binding to the upstream promoter region of EMRV and thus regulating its gene. So what we did, we incubated 146 base pair intergenic region between OSTR and EMRV that is containing the EMRV promoter sequence with increasing concentration of OSTR, followed by EMSA. So EMSA is the electrophoretic mobility shift asset, and the idea is to see that you can see radio level DNA, and the presence of radio level DNA here, they detect that. Once the DNA is not bound to protein, the, it will move faster, but once the gene is bound to protein, you will see complex formation and movement will be retarded. Okay. So as we're seeing here, that OSTR forms at these three complexes with the complement DNA, and the faster moving complex is seen at lower concentration of protein, whereas the slower migrating complex that's seen at higher concentration of protein. We calculated the dissociation constant or KD, it's approximately seven nanomolar, it has a decent affinity for its complement DNA. So now we're talking about EMRB, multivariate transporter two, and its regulation. So it was worth to say that what would be the substrates that this EMR is actually extruding? So we did take assays. Uh, <coughs> we uh, used three different cultures, y type, delta OSTR X, delta EMRBX. We did a serial dilution spotted on LV plates, uh, which is having different antibodies and disease factors. So in this case, I'd like to mention that delta OSTR X or delta EMRBX, these are the actually transposal mutant of OSTR and EMRV respectively. And this transposon contains a specific antibiotic acid. So we just took out this acid. And thus we created these strains, Delta OSTR X and Delta EMRV X. Okay, so that we don't see any effect of those uh, antibiotic acids there. Now, trimethoprim is one of the commonly used antibiotics to treat bacterial infection. So it inhibits uh, dihydrofolate reductors and thus uh, it will inhibit the DNA synthesis in bacteria. And uh, trimethoprim is actually used in combination of another antibiotic, sulfamethoxazole, okay, to treat bacterial infection. So as you see here, that both wild type and delta blister X, they show increased resistance to trimethoprim. In delta blister X, that is consistent with the upregulation of EMRP. Okay, 
okay? So when the luster is not there, EMR is upregulated. Now EMR becomes to primitory. And that is also uh, consistent with the growth phenotype of delta EMR waves because when EMR is not there, that is sensitive to primitory. So that means EMR wave is a primary exporter of primitory. Now, in another study, it has been shown that in Barcuda recipientia, EMRB uh, that extrudes malitixic acid and tetracycline, those are, uh, I mean, antibiotics which is also commonly used to treat bacterial infection. We also wanted to know that, okay, so what's going on in this case? So as you're seeing here, that malitixic acid that seems toxic to wild type and delta EMRBX. But delta OST or X that shows increased resistance to nitric acid and again it is consistent with the upregulation of EMR. So when EMR is there, it can exclude nitric acid. But yes, other exporters are also there to exclude these compounds. Okay, let's move on with some other antibiotics and disinfectants. So we uh, tested pentacycline, delta mycin, zinc that can be toxic. Uh, it is in toxic uh, concentration. BAC, that is benzalkonium chloride, and CHX. CHX is the chlorhexidine. So BAC and CHX are commonly used disinfectants. We use this one in the oral solutions, or in mouthwash, or in the hospital environments. So these are very commonly used as uh, disinfectants. So as you see here, that both of these mutant strain, OS, Delta Western X and Delta EMRB X, they are showing increased resistance to each of these uh, antibiotics or the disinfectants. In case of delta oesters, it's understandable because when oesters not there, EMR is upregulated and it can actually exclude this, maybe it's excluding this compound, right? But what's going on in case of delta EMRBX? Because delta EMRBX is showing increased resistance to this uh, antibiotics or the disinfectants. So we were wondering, obviously, there are some other exporters or transporters which is excluding these antibiotics or disinfectants. So in another study, it has been shown that two RNG transporters named AMRB and BPF, they were induced by the presence of an antibiotic named doxycycline. Doxycycline is tetracycline derivative. But it was dependent on the doxycycline concentration. So we were wondering that what could be the other exporter that is excluding this tetracycline. So what we did, we determined the expression of AMRB, that is RNG flux pump, uh, in EMRB X mutant and OSTR mutant, in presence of uh, like different concentration of tetracycline. So as you're seeing here, it takes at least 10 microgram per ml tetracycline to, in, to see the induction of AMRB. So I'm going back to this slide. The increased resistance of AMRB mutant that you're see, uh, seeing here to tetracycline. It could be because when EMRB is not there, there is an accumulation of tetracycline in the environment, okay? And that induces this RNB transporter. And now this RNB transporter can export tetracycline. And so you see the strain <coughs> survives. And probably the same thing is going on in case of gentamicin or other uh, disinfectants. Uh, there are some other exporters too. Basically, in particular sinocybacia, it has been shown that chlorhexidine like uh, depending on the chlorhexidine concentration, different RND and uh, major facilitator superfamily transporters were upregulated. I'd like to mention here that this EMRB belongs to major facilitator superfamily. So it has been shown in particular uh, series patient. Let's move ahead. So from the take, uh, basic data from here is what steer binds to the upstream sequence of EMRB thus represents its expression. In presence of subdental dose of gentamicin, when oestir is repressed, EMRB is upregulated. EMRB is the primary transporter for prime methylene. EMRB also transports nitric acid and tetracycline, but he has other exporters with it too. Many of our homologs, they uh, actually they have cysts in their structure. And uh, it has been shown that many marrow homologs undergo cysteine oxidation, and that actually modulates target gene expression. When we looked into the amniacy sequence of OSTR, we have seen that OSTR harbors three cysteines are more hard. And the cysteines, cysteine 3, 4, and cysteine 1, 6, 9, they are located on the N terminal and C terminal extension, which is shown here with the bolded layers. 
I'll talk about these extensions a little bit later. But for now, we know that oil steer harbors three systems per monomer, that means six systems per dimer. So that's making this oil steer very prone to the conditions of oxidative stress or to the conditions of, I mean, to, to the oxidation. So we were interested to see that under the conditions of oxidative stress, whether the systems are contributing to the G regulation, whether something is happening that's modulating the garbage expression. So what we did, we uh, incubated a wild type culture and oyster reagent in presence of hydrogen peroxide or copper chloride. And as we're seeing here, that in both cases, EMRB is either upregulated. I mean, there's a change in the EMRB expression, the upregulation down regulation in wild type strain, but there's no significant change in EMRB expression in the oyster. So that means oyster is required to regulate EMRB under the conditions of oxidative stress. Now, we also tested redox inactive metal, zinc, and in presence of zinc, we see EMRB is upregulated in wild type, but there is no significant change in EMRB expression in their double steel. That means that also in presence of metal toxicity, I mean, oyster is required to regulate EMRB. And OSTR regulates EMRB differentially in presence of different oxidants. It depends on the nature of the oxidants. That's why you see that in presence of different oxidants, EMRB is upregulated or downregulated. It completely depends. Now, for, uh, I mean, so we know that Oyster is regulated EMRB differentially under the conditions of oxidative stress, right? So now we're interested to see that whether oxidized Oyster is binding to the promoter sequence of EMRB and thus repressing or upregulating its expression. So we did ENSA, and as we're seeing here, uh, by incubating uh, this promoter sequence of EMRB uh, with increasing concentration of oxidized protein, and as we're seeing here, that oxidized protein also forms three complexes with uh, cognitive DNA, like the reduced one. So we don't see that much significant difference in the gel picture, but when we calculate the dissociation constant, it is actually 10 nanomolar. It's not marked different from the wild type period, that was 7 nanomolar. So that means that there is no significant difference in the DNA binding affinity between the reduced and the oxidized protein. But oxidation actually leads to differential regulation of EMR. So it is actually not uncommon. In bacillus subtilis, it has been shown that one of the transcription factors, HEPAR, and uh, that binds to the cognate DNA with similar binding affinity, uh, that's reduced or oxidized protein, but only oxidized HEPAR activates target gene expression. So this is not actually uncommon. So it depends that what, uh, it depends on the nature of the oxidants and how it's changing the conformation of the protein, how it's affecting the DNA binding affinity. So as EMRB gene regulation was modulated by the presence of different inorganic oxidants, so it was worth to see the growth phenotype of the significance in presence of oxidants. So we treated our uh, cultures with either hydrogen peroxide or copper chloride. And as so we see here, that EMRB mutant that shows similar uh, growth phenotype like wild type to either hydrogen peroxide or copper chloride, but OST here that shows opposite phenotype to hydrogen peroxide and copper chloride. So in case of hydrogen peroxide, so there's an assumption or there's a possibility that oyster is regulating other genes too. And when oyster is not there, it cannot confer resistance to hydrogen peroxide. I mean that, that strain is like sensitive to hydrogen peroxide. And in case of copper, oyster is showing uh, increased resistance and that is again consistent with the EMRB upregulation. So EMRB can exclude copper. And that's a possibility we're talking about. Okay, so now the key upshot is oyster regulates EMRB differentially, and it actually depends on the nature of the oxidant. So oxidation gives OSTR a flexibility for the gene regulation. Let's look at the model of the mercury analysis OSTR. So I would like to say this one is model because the structure is not yet resolved, right? So uh, this is the model. So as Mara homolog, oyster exists as homodimer. And uh, this is the dimeric oyster that you are uh, seeing here. And it consists of six alpha helices and three beta strands. And the dimensional regions consist of ANC terminal alpha 1, alpha 5, and alpha 6 helices. 
and this uh, arrow is indicating to the alpha-4 recognition levels. Now, the unique feature of this protein is the presence of N and C terminal extension. And these extensions are not actually accommodated in, in this protein uh, and port code of protein because there is no available template to accommodate these extensions. So we have shown the terminal amino acid residues, uh, 238 and LA 164, I mean, to show where these extensions could be. And uh, we calculated electro electrostatic surface potential of this protein, and as you see here, the another unusual feature of this protein is the presence of highly positively charged on one row of the protein in comparison to the other row. And this is really like unusual in case of Mara homologs. And uh, when we looked into this positive charge patch, we have seen that there's a constellation of white arginine and lysine residues, which may contribute to this over positive charge uh, patch. And the notable feature, I already mentioned that one. Uh, but I'd like to mention here too that presence of three cysteines are monomer, and the cysteines are located on A terminal extension and C terminal extension. This is not in the core fold of the protein. This is on the extension. So that's very interesting, and this is really unique, like all these features that we're seeing in case of first year. Okay, so we determined thermal stability of this protein by thermal stability assay. So the principle of this assay is we use cipro orange water dye, which binds to the hydrophobic pore of the protein. So once the protein is unfolded with increasing temperature, now cipro orange can bind to the hydrophobic pore of the exposed hydrophobic pore of the protein and you see the increment of fluorescence. So we plotted the data as a cipro orange water fluorescence as a function of temperature, and the denatrition temperature of first year is approximately 34 degrees Celsius, which is not that much high, right? So, but when first is bound to DNA or zinc or any ligand, the thermal st uh, stability of this protein goes up. So that makes sense because usually when protein is bound to any ligand, it actually uh, is more compact or folded. So now oyster is more stable when bound to the gas. Let's uh, uh, I mean, get back to the systems. So as I say that many viral homologs actually sense uh, I mean, oxidative stress by implying their systems, right? So systems can form disulfide bonds in the presence of oxidants. So we were wondering that, okay, these three systems per monomer and having six systems per dimer, well, they are also probably disulfide bonds in presence of oxidants. So we did SGSH analysis by incubating our protein with increasing concentration of either hydrogen peroxide or copper chloride. So as you see here, the OSTR form intramolecular disulfide bond 